it is it is happening in a week, less than a week, next Friday. So we're excited. We've got our volunteers in place, and they're excited. And uh, our guests, we have 105 guests coming that are who are registered. So it's big this year, plus their caretakers and parents and whoever comes with them. And uh, so it's going to be a party. It's going to be a good night. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a very blessed event. And uh, and now, now give us some information where it's going to be held, the times, just in case there's somebody out there listening that doesn't know. It starts at six o'clock on Friday night, the the tenth, February tenth, uh, at the Bolivar Intermediate School. That's at 1300 North Hartford in Bolivar. So uh, volunteers park in the back of the school so the guests in limousines can come through the front of the school and use those parking lots. So um, we'll have a red carpet entry into the dance with a professional DJ and photo booths, professional prom photos um, dinner, catered dinner, uh, karaoke, uh, what? Oh, oh yes, and the limo rides, of course, um, but all kinds of things to do for everybody and a lot of fun to be had. It's all pre to our guests and their, their loved ones coming with them. Very nice, very nice. It's a it's a wonderful event. If you uh, if you have never got to in participate in that, uh, for sure, for sure, get in the middle of that because it's a good one. Go ahead. Martha. Coffee, tea, and D meet Sunday afternoon from three until four. We'll be gathering here tomorrow in the Connection Building, and right at the corner of Division and Springfield. So uh, if you'd like some lively conversation about scripture and this message that Pastor Michael has given us tonight, come by and join us. All right. Coffee, tea, and is on this week. Anybody else got one? I have a request. I've kind of got a little bit of a project going. And if anybody has an old laptop that's out of date that they're not using uh, but would be good for uh, basically video, uh, 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 basically we are going to try to see if we can do some online parenting classes. And the idea would be we would uh, tie it in with our Wednesday night service. But it's just kind of in this planning right now and just trying to get things organized. but. Like say, if you have uh, an old laptop that we could use for someone that wouldn't have uh, computer and internet access, that would be great. Okay. All right. Now, anything else? If not, let's stand and worship. the morning wake up in the arms of glory to finally see the sun above the pouring rain until I fall into surrender healing hands and remember there's a river on the other side of pain I'm gonna a better day coming I know rejoice rejoice I'm gonna sing either way it goes there's a better day coming I know I know I know I know mm -hmm. until the bound 
boundary lines have broken The levee gives and hearts fill open To flood the land we fight over with endless love Until forgiveness steals the blame Of every heart, soul, mind and strength Until we know there's nothing left to do but trust Oh, I'm gonna rejoice Rejoice Lift it up in the highs and lows There's a better day coming, I know a better day coming I know I know I know I know I know I know oh my soul send in the choir raise my song in the flood of the fire oh my soul send in the choir hope is ringing out higher and Oh, my soul, send in the choir Raise my song in the flood of the fire Oh, my soul, send in the choir Hope is ringing out higher and higher Rejoice, and again I say rejoice Lift it up in the highs and lows There's a better day coming, I know a better day coming I know and glorify your holy name. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us, dear Lord, in this service, dear Lord, and stir that Holy Spirit inside of us that we might receive your words. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us always, Lord. Walk beside us and walk with us. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. One day there'll be no more waiting left for our souls. One day there'll be no more children longing for home. One day when the kingdom comes right here where we stand, we will see the promised land. Ooh. One day there'll be no more lives taken too soon. One day there'll be no more need for hospital rooms. One day every tear that falls will be wiped by his hand, and we will see the promised land. Ooh, hallelujah, there will be healing from this heartbreak we've been feeling. The darkest night cause we know the light will come and there will be healing hallelujah one day there'll be no more anger left in our eyes one day the color of our skin won't cause a divide one day we'll be family standing hand in hand. We will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Hallelujah. There will be healing from this heartbreak. We've 
been feeling We'll sing in the darkest night Cause we know the light will come And there will be healing Hallelujah And there will be healing Hallelujah One day Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. One day when our tired and weary bones find their rest. One day when the power of evil's brought to an end. We will see the promised land. We will see the promised land. Hallelujah. There will be healing from this heart. Break. We've been feeling We'll sing in the darkest night Cause we know the light will come And there will be healing Hallelujah And there will be healing
nobody but Jesus. Now, where have you seen God this week? Anybody got one? Well, they say there are no coincidences. There are only God incidences. So Ooh, we read our one. devotion this morning, and uh, at the conclusion of it, it said, who is God asking you to console or listen to today? And we have received not one, but two phone calls today with people in distress who need somebody to talk to. Nice. And it, you, it's amazing. I, we didn't make the phone calls, so God just took the reins and, <laughs> yeah. and they called us. So that's where I saw God today. Absolutely. He always, always opens that door. When you ask, he always swings that door wide open and, he, and you receive uh, and, and are able to see that in, in, in the work. Of, that's when you're close to God, that's what happens. He speaks right through all things that are around you. It's a beautiful thing. Has anybody else got one? Well, Thursday night, we, it was Thursday that we had the uh, volunteer meeting. And... Uh, just seeing all the people coming together for the night to shine, all the volunteers, uh, people being excited about it, and that is a very cool thing. Uh, and I, I was going to mention here, uh, I forgot to mention the chili lunch next Saturday the 11th, uh, 11 to 2, and it's uh, going to be $8 for adults and $4 for children, so. Okay, got a chili lunch going on here too next next weekend. Has anybody else got one? Prayer request, a joy, a concern? If not, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll follow this by the Lord's Prayer. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, we come before you today, Lord, we still... And always, we just thank you. We thank you for everything that you do for us, Lord. And all the ways that we see you at work in our lives and in the lives of others around us and in the world around us. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us, dear Lord, as we, as we, as we come together, dear Lord, and, and as we collectively think about how you are and what you are and how we see you at work in the world. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with each prayer request that was spoken, the spoken ones, dear Lord, and the unspoken ones here tonight, dear Lord, because you know our hearts and you know our minds. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with each and every everything that we do, dear Lord, and, and make it all to glorify your holy name. As we come together to pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come into this time of tithes and offering, I would like to thank each one of you for your support of the Bolivar United Methodist Church here at Bolivar, Missouri, and the support of the United Methodist Church worldwide. I would sure appreciate everything that you do and where you're involved and all the different stuff that you're involved in. It does, it does, it does my heart really good to see the activity and the excitement going around all of the things that are going on at the Bolivar United Methodist Church, and I sure appreciate everything that you folks do and how you are, how you are so attentive. Uh, we we won't pass the offering basket. We'll we'll do as we have been doing for quite some time. Uh, drop your offerings and your ties in the in the basket as you come or as you go. If you're joining us online, uh, you can you can uh, tap on the link that you're watching us on here and give through that link. You can uh, drop your drop your offerings and ties off at the office. You can send them in. There's several different ways that you can donate and join. 
join. And if, and if you would like to join in with some of the activities that goes on here at the Bolivar United Methodist Church, we, uh, we do a lot of community outreach stuff. And uh, we would sure appreciate everything that you would do and anything that you would offer. We appreciate all that you do. If you would join with me in the prayer of abundance. O oh, gracious, merciful, and abundant God, with thankful hearts we give you our praise, our offerings, and all that we are. Let the world see your generous nature working through us. Make us a reflection of your love. Amen. Salt and light. Well, we've been uh, we've been kind of going through the through the throes of of recognizing God and and uh, recognizing God in our lives and in the world around us and how how God is recognized in the Bible and how it how it how it points to us and how we can recognize God within us. Our scripture reading tonight comes to you from uh, from Matthew's gospel and so Matthew's gospel chapter five verses thirteen through twenty and so the context of this piece of scripture here is uh, you you know the Sermon on the Mount. Starts in chapter five. That's where it starts, and so you go. So you go through the beatitudes, and and blessed are the poor, and blessed are this, and blessed are that. The last beatitude that, that is there in, in verse eleven, five verse eleven. I want to read this one. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, persecute you falsely, and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice. And be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. The context of this piece of scripture is this right here. Verse 1 in, in chapter 5, it says this. Now when Jesus saw the crowds... He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And so there are crowds of people around him at this Sermon on the Mount, but he is actually speaking to his disciples. He is speaking to believers, disciples of Jesus Christ, when he is talking to these people, and he is teaching them. And so... It goes through the Beatitudes, and so then we, we jump on to verse 13. So verse 13 says this, You are the salt of the earth, but if, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world, a town built on a hill, cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, or the prophets, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until the heavens and the earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses the Pharisees, surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, 
you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, this piece of scripture, I want to work backwards at it because I want to address the law to start with. We talk, and, and, I, and, I've, and I've said this about Jesus and, and, how, and how Jesus done things on the Sabbath and the Pharisees was trying to pick at him here and there. And, and so this piece of scripture says something specific to us about the law. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. Right here in verse 17, the law or the prophets. Now, the law was quite extensive back in the day. There were not only the Ten Commandments, there were 613 laws that had to be followed. And on top of those laws that had to be followed, there was the traditions of the elders, which made it over a thousand laws that had to be followed. And so what happens is these pieces overlap one another. And so, so you have, and so th I re was reading something this week as I was researching and trying, and trying to figure all this out. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law or the prophets. Now, the prophets is a pretty easy one because the prophecy is all about who? All about one man. When you start reading the Old Testament, the Old Testament screams that someone is coming. That's what the Old Testament tells us. Someone is coming. And we cannot do this on our own. Period. Those are the two things that the Old Testament tells us. The Old Testament tells us there's somebody coming. We can't do this on their own. This someone that's coming is going to help you to be able to do this. That's all about the Old Testament right there. So the prophets, all of this prophecy was all around Jesus and his coming. When it says, it ain't going to be done until it's finished, this prophecy is not fulfilled yet. We're still waiting. We're still waiting on some of this prophecy to be fulfilled. And so none of this law is obsolete at this point. So what we had, and this is the way this guy broke this down, and I, and I, found, I found it a whole lot easier for me to understand when he broke it down this way. They had, now Israel was a huge nation, right? I mean, they had 12 tribes and millions and millions of people, right? So it was a nation. So they had a ceremonial law, which had to do with the sacrifice. It had to do with circumcision. It had to do with uh, cleansing and so forth and that kind of stuff. All the ceremonial stuff that they did inside of the temple. So they had ceremonial law. They had civil law, which, which, uh, which was all, this. you can eat this food, you can not eat this food, you can do this, you can do that, you have to dress a certain way, you, how you settle your differences, all of that is the civil law of the children of Israel. And you had the moral law. Now, the moral law was those first ten commandments that was given to Moses on the mountain. That's the moral law. And all of these other laws were built around this moral law. So when you look at Jesus Christ, there was not one of these moral laws that he ever didn't follow. Every one of them was followed. So we're going to take, for example, and this is just an example, how these laws overlapped one another. Now, the, the, law, the law said... In Moses' law, this is one of the commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That was the law, right? That was what it was in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, instead of leaving it like this, these traditions of the elders said, okay, well, God rested on the, sa on the Sabbath day after he made the earth, and he rested on the Sabbath day, so the Sabbath day, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. So the Sabbath day is the day of rest, right? Everybody agree with that, right? Okay, so, so now we're going to go one farther. Well, okay, the Sabbath day is the day of rest. Now, 
we're going to, the, the traditions of the elders say that you can't do anything on the Sabbath. And so now you have to follow that law. So now when you start adding to and adding to and adding to these laws, all of a sudden these laws get ridiculous after a while. Instead of, instead of saying this is what the law is, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. We do. But you know what? If there's a brother or sister that's in trouble and they need my help, I'm going to be there. I guarantee you. And that's what Jesus was doing. This is, this is a morality thing. And so when, so when they overlap one another like that, and, they, and, they, and then they, they, they kind of get it to where, okay, now we can pick and choose. And so now, all of a sudden, these laws accommodate who? The ones that are making these laws. The traditions of the elders. One thing right after another. And so you got this one verse in the end of it and this is the one that kind of bugged me a little bit the very last verse says this for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven now okay wait a minute the Pharisees and the teachers of the law they knew the law. They followed the law to the letter, each and every one of them. So how am I, a just a common person, going to surpass my righteousness, surpass theirs? Here's what he's saying. The law is the law. The law doesn't give you relationship. The law is the law. The law and relationship are two different things. And you can follow the law and follow every one of the laws and never have a relationship with God. And all of a sudden, now you're following the laws and so you're just going through the motions and your righteousness is nothing because you're just following the law. You have got no relationship with God. And... And so I go, oh, okay, there's where that, where that really is. And so it took me a minute to get my head wrapped around that because these were teachers of the law. These elders, all of this tradition and all of everything that goes along with it, this is what we do, this is what we do, all this tradition, all this symbolism of the tradition that they did was all around all of these laws. And... When you, when you look at it, I go, well, okay, well, there we go. So, our righteousness is built on relationship. Relationship with Jesus Christ, the belief in Jesus Christ, and our relationship with God. It's not built on the law. The law is the law. And we are supposed to follow the law, this morale law, all of these laws. We are supposed to follow those laws. It tells us right there. You're supposed to follow this law because we're not abolishing the law. We're fulfilling the law. Jesus fulfilled the laws. And he fulfilled all of the prophecies, every one of them that came down through, fulfilling the prophecies, fulfilling the law. He says in the first part of this that you are the salt of the earth and you are the light. It doesn't say, well, you might be, or, well, you could be. It says, you are. And he's talking to his disciples, and he's talking to believers as he's preaching this Sermon on the Mount. And so he's talking to the people that believe in Jesus Christ, and he says that you are this. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. And so the symbolism around this, around this salt and I, and I found it kind of interesting that, uh, that, the, uh, that the salt aspect of this whole thing was, was, goes way back. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Uh, in Leviticus uh, chapter 2 says this, Season all of your grain offerings with salt. Do not leave the salt of the covenant of your God out 
of your grain offerings. Add salt to all of your offerings. So, all the way back to the very first, when they are setting up these offerings and these sacrifices that they're doing, even at that point, they were using salt. Salt has many, many different uses. The salt and the three that we're going to pick on today are these. Salt brings flavor. It brings the flavor out in meat, brings the flavor out in your food. It just brings flavor. So if we say you are the salt of the earth, if you say you bring flavor, you're the salt, so you bring flavor, what does that mean to you? In a world that just kind of goes along, as Christians, we bring flavor to this world. That's who we are. That's what we are. We bring the flavor out in the world. We are, are, that, are that part of it. We are the salt. The salt, salt also heals. The healing power of salt. Have you ever uh, swam in the ocean and had a cut, an open wound? What happens to that open wound? Moon. Heals up. Heals up. All of a sudden it heals up. And so salt is healing. Back in the day when, uh, when the Jewish children were born, they bathed the children with salt and water to kill any bacteria or anything like that that was on those, those children through their birth. And so to cleanse them, it was a salt and water mixture. Healing process. We are the salt of the earth. So we are part of the healing of a broken world that's out there. That's us. That's us. We're part of it. We are part of that healing process in a world that is broken and damaged. And so the next piece is we're the preservative. Salt is a preservative. You, over and over again, salt preserves. Salt preserves this. Salt preserves this. It's for used for tanning. It's used for all kinds of different stuff. You, you smokehouse meats. They didn't have refrigerators back in the day, so they cured their stuff with salt. It's a preservative. So if you are the salt of the world, of the earth, and salt is a preservative, so that means that we are also a preservative in this world. Well, what are, we, what are we preserving? We're preserving others so they might have the promise of that eternal life that Jesus Christ came to bring to this world. And we like to kind of back away from the world and we like to go, okay, you know what, you guys stay over there, we're going to stay over here in our little group. Have you been out on social media lately? Have you seen these influencers that have thousands and millions of followers and they're influencers and this and they're influencers and that? You are influencers. So with this piece of scripture, you are the salt of the earth, meaning that you're a preservative, that you are healing, that you bring flavor to this world, that means that each and every one of you are influencers. We influence others to move in a direction of peace and harmony, love, joy, goodwill, and beauty in the world. And there's so much stuff. Have you ever been around a person that's got this negative gnarly attitude you just don't want to be around them very much you 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 try and and you get around them and you go nah well you know it might be a bad to back off now if you're around a person that's got a great personality it's always laughing it's always joyful that's always telling a joke or or doing something funny you love to be around that person right 
when we have the love of God in our life and the joy of our salvation in our life, we should always be that person. We should always be that person, that laughing, joking. We should have joy in our lives because we have something that the whole world needs. We've got it. It's in us. It lives in us. With, uh, within this piece of scripture, it says, it says uh, that you are the light of the world. Well, there's several back and forth on that whole deal. And I started checking, looking at that one. And uh, Jesus Christ says in, uh, in John's gospel, John chapter 8, verse 12, it says this. Oh, wrong verse. I want to read this one. John chapter 9, verse 5 says this. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is Jesus Christ telling his disciples who he is. He is the light of the world. In John chapter 8, it says this. When Jesus spoke again, the people said, he said to the people, I am the light of the world. Whosoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so we realize that following Jesus gives us that light, that light that we don't have to walk in darkness. In, uh, in John's gospel also it says this. Now, now John's gospel, it kind of it splits it up. Jesus, here he is, he's teaching his disciples, and then, and then he's getting ready to go to the cross, and now he's preparing his disciples that he's going to be leaving I'm going to be leaving. You're going to have to pick up this and go on with it. And so he says this. Then Jesus told them, You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before the darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of the light. Once again, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. He didn't say maybe. He didn't say mm, you could be. He said you are. You are, you are those people. You are those people. Now, in the, in the middle of this, of this piece of scripture, it's got this. <clears throat> in the same way, let your light shine before others that, you may, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Does that mean for us to go out and do good deeds and then say, look what I've done. Look what I've done. Look at all that I've done for God. No, nope, it doesn't mean that. It means for us to love God enough that we want to do for others without recognition, without boosting ourself without self and we have a problem with that because we like to have that attaboy pat on the back now don't we I'm that guy I like to have an attaboy pat on the back every once in a while I really do if I worked hard at something I'd like somebody to say to recognize that I've done a good job I would and that's just human condition, brothers and sisters. That's all it is. That's just a human condition. That's how we are. That's how we're built. And we fight against that human condition all the time. Because everything we do, if we recognize and realize what is happening here, not a breath that we draw, not one breath that we draw is not God-given. Each and everything that we are given from the shoes on our feet to my glasses, my new glasses. 
It's God given. I don't deserve one thing. I don't deserve any of it. God's grace is given to me. It was poured out upon me, an undeserving person on this planet. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing that this piece of scripture right here lets us know who we are. We are part of something that's bigger than us, the salt of this earth, the light of Christ that lives now within us. We are part of the body of Christ. We're elegant. We're beautiful. We have the light that lives within us. Now, the enemy is always out there, though. And the enemy will tell you that you're not worthy. That they will tell you, he will tell you that you should be ashamed of all of the stuff that you have done. Jesus came to this earth to forgive us of our sin. And all we have to do is ask. Humble ourselves on our knees and ask God for forgiveness and he wipes the slate clean and not that we're going to from that point forward we're going to always be good and we never have to ask for forgiveness again because that's not the way this works either it's a daily thing we have to seek him daily we have to ask for his forgiveness we and, and there's some ways that I fail that I fail in that I don't even realize I hurt somebody's feelings by saying something that I shouldn't have said. Out of, oh, well, I just throwed it out there. And sometimes we do that. It just happens. It just happens. And that's our human condition. And maybe the other side of it is also human condition. We may be taking offense at something or have a chip on our shoulder also. That's human condition also. We have to fight against this human condition. It's a constant battle within us. Our human condition is here, but we also have Jesus Christ we've accepted into our hearts that guides us and lets us know where that human condition needs to be going. Yeah, no, that's not right. This is the example. This is where we go. Keep your eyes on the prize. That's exactly what this is saying to us. We're the salt of the earth. We're the preservative. We are sit here to preserve others. Those that are walking in darkness, salt takes a minute to work. It takes a minute to work. Light, on the other hand, works immediately. As soon as you walk into the room and hit the switch, the light fills the room. It's immediate. Salt, it takes some time. It takes some time to work. It takes some time to heal a wound. It takes some time to do a little bit of those other things. The salt does. Purification. Salt, the symbolism in the Bible for salt, and there's, and there's a few of them, Salts, salts symbolizes eternity. It symbolizes a permanence, and it symbolizes incorruption. So the symbolizing around the salt, how it is not corrupt, how it cures and heals and purifies things around, around all of these different passages in the Bible. There's over 40 times that it's mentioned in the Bible. Uh, and, and, it, and, it, and it strikes me that, that this is the way the, the Bible is put together. There's over 40 different authors in, in the Bible, writers, 40 different writers, over 1,500 years, and it all mashes together and makes this beautiful piece of Scripture that, that we learn from daily and that is ongoing in our life, the law and the prophets. Jesus came to fulfill the law and to fulfill the prophecies. 
And he done them all the way to his resurrection and his ascension. And there's still prophecy left that is not being fulfilled yet. So this Bible is an ongoing thing. And we are a part of something that is way bigger than what we are. We are a part of a body of Christ. And as we come into this time of communion, this symbolism also is part of who we are and what we are. And, it, and it's nice how this all ties together for us. And it should speak great volumes to each and every one of us. As Jesus Christ sat with his 12 disciples on the night that he was going to be arrested, he took and he broke the bread and he passed it to each one of them. And he said, here, take and eat, for this is my body broken for you. And as long as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And when the meal was finished, he took the cup and he raised the cup and he blessed it. And he passed the cup to each one of his disciples and he said, here, take and drink. For this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the sins of many. That's you and me. After all of this time, this is what this is. The symbolism of Jesus' body and his blood being within us. And from the Bible and what he tells us and who we are, we should have a different perspective on ourself. It says that we should not hide who we are. Don't put a light underneath a basket. Put it out in the middle of the room that it can shine for everyone to see. That light is you. That salt is you. You are part of something greater than ourselves. Would you pray with me, please? Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, we ask that you would bless these elements, dear Lord, and make them for us the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask, dear Father, that you would always help us recognize and remember, dear Lord, that, that your body is within us and your blood courses through our veins. We ask, dear Father, that you would help us to realize just who we are, dear Lord, and the power that we possess through you, through you and your light living within us. The self-control that sometimes we don't have. All we have to do, dear Lord, is surrender ourselves to you. And you will give us the ability to control self. And that is one of the greatest things that you have done for us. The salvation that you have brought to us, dear Lord. And the promise of that eternal life. Eternity with you preservative we are the salt we have the message help us dear Lord to find the strength in our legs and the power in our voice dear Lord that we might share you with others we ask dear father that you would be with us now as we participate in this communion feast, dear Lord, and help us to realize that we're all part of the same body of Christ. We ask, dear Father, that you would be with us. Lead us and guide us, dear Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. Art, would you come forward?
told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful that you'll never the power of Christ in you always overcome the power of evil in this world and it will always the power of God is bigger than any of the worldly things in this world fear is a liar he's a liar don't cover your light shine your light to the world they need it out there it's a dark dark place and he sometimes puts us 
in dark places so we can be that light to others. As you take the light of Christ out into the world this week, always remember that someone is watching you. Would you pray with me, please? Good and gracious Heavenly Father, mighty God, once again we come before you today. Lord, we just thank you for another opportunity to be in your house with your people. We ask, dear Father, that you would go with us out into the world this week, dear Lord, and help us to realize who we are, the salt and the light of this world. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray, amen. God bless you all.